Good morning and welcome to the 32nd meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2018. Uh, we have received apologies from Brian Whittle. Can I ask everyone in the room please to ensure mobile phones are off or on silent uh, and not to record our uh, film proceedings. Uh, we have now uh, put in place the arrangements to do that ourselves. The first item on our agenda is an evidence session on the Healthcare International Arrangements Bill 2017-19. UK Parliament legislation for which a legislative consent memorandum has now been lodged uh, and which we anticipate will be formally referred to this committee uh, in short order. The bill was introduced in the House of Commons on the 26th of October 2018. It is one of a series of bills intended to adjust UK legislation for Brexit in addition to the European Union Withdrawal Act uh, and it is intended to allow the UK to maintain reciprocal health arrangements with the EU and its member states after Brexit, whether or not a withdrawal agreement is reached. The provisions of the bill are not limited to arrangements with the EU, and the UK government has stated the bill would also allow the UK to strengthen existing reciprocal healthcare arrangements with countries out with the EU or to reach new ones. So to give evidence on that, may I welcome to the committee Paul Gray, Director of Health and uh, Social Care and Chief Executive of NHS Scotland, Shirley Rogers, Director of Health Workforce Leadership and Service Transformation, Liz Sadler, Deputy Director, Planning and Quality Division, Ian Davidson, Head of Constitution and UK Relations, and John Patterson, Divisional Solicitor. Uh, welcome. Uh, can I start by uh, acknowledging that uh, Paul Gray has uh, let us know that he intends to step down in the coming weeks and allow me to record the committee's Thanks to Paul for his leadership uh, over the last five years within the NHS in Scotland, and personally my own thanks for his leadership in health and care over an even longer period. Uh, on behalf of the committee, Paul, I wish you well in your future endeavours. Uh, however, it does fall to this committee to interrogate you one last time at least, uh, and so uh, I, I invite you to make an opening statement. Thank you, convener, and, and thank you for your uh, kind words. I've certainly uh, felt it's a great privilege to hold the role and, and also to appear before parliamentary committees, which I regard as a, an essential component of public service and being held to account. So thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here today with colleagues uh, to discuss the Legislative Consent Memorandum for the UK Health Care International Arrangements Bill, which was lodged in the Parliament and published on Thursday the 6th of December. On leaving the EU, the reciprocal health care arrangements currently in place may no longer apply in their current form and UK legislation is required to provide for future arrangements. In broad terms, the Bill gives powers to the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care to fund and arrange health care outside the UK and to put in place reciprocal health care arrangements between the UK and other countries or international organisations such as the EU. Scottish ministers and the UK government agree that the bill impacts on the devolved function of health and as a result it requires the consent of the Scottish Parliament. UK government officials have indicated that the bill will be amended to recognise the responsibility of the devolved administrations. The current proposal is to introduce a requirement to consult the devolved administrations and enter into a memorandum of understanding with them before regulations can be introduced to impact on devolved matters. In the event of a deal between the EU and the UK, the EU withdrawal bill will allow the current reciprocal health arrangements to continue during the implementation period. However, in the event of no deal, this legislation would be needed quickly to put new arrangements in place. The committee uh, is no doubt aware that in June this year, the UK government proceeded to pass the EU withdrawal bill. Uh, despite the refusal of the Scottish Parliament to give its legislative consent to relevant provisions of the Bill and UK Government Ministers expressed the view that Brexit is not normal and fell within the exceptions uh, applying to the Sewell Convention. But since that Bill, the Scottish Government has taken the view that it should not seek formal legislative consent from the Parliament for Brexit Bills. But it, the Scottish Government has, however, made clear that it will cooperate in developing Bills and in supporting this Parliament's scrutiny, it has lodged LCMs on the Trade Bill, the Agriculture Bill, the Fisheries Bill and now this Health Care Bill. Scottish Ministers have also said that formal legislative consent could be sought for Brexit legislation in exceptional circumstances. 
The Scottish Government believes that there are exceptional circumstances for this bill, given the need to provide reassurance to Scots who access state health care in the European economic area under the existing reciprocal schemes, and the Government will therefore lodge an LCM for this bill. On reciprocal health care more generally, my letter of 4 December to the Committee indicated that six NHS boards were not participating in the UK Government's EHIC incentive scheme. That number included NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde. We have since received further returns the November statistics after I wrote to the Committee, and I am pleased to report that Greater Glasgow and Clyde now has recorded EHIC uh, activity and has recovered £120,000. I am meeting the Health Board Chief Executives this evening and I propose to take up with the remaining five boards the question of why they do not participate in this scheme. Finally, Convener, um, we have sought to anticipate in those we have brought the range of questions that the Committee might ask, but clearly the, the subject is broad and could um, attract questions from members on, on, on many aspects. So if there is any information I do not have today, I will give an undertaking to the Committee to provide it at the earliest possible moment after this session has concluded. Thank you. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, 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 Paul, that's much appreciated. Can I start off, and, and you're, you rightly say that it's a very broad subject, and I think the Committee is very keen to understand the scope of the current arrangements and how they operate. Can you explain what currently happens if a visitor from out with the European Economic Area uh, wishes to register with a GP? I'll ask Liz Sadler to come in on this in a second. The, the, my understanding is that um, we, are, uh, we encourage um, GPs to establish a uh, person's country of origin, but we do not wish to deprive them of primary health care services, so we have not so mandated. But Liz could perhaps say a little more. Yeah, um, so, in t we, the, the, um, sorry, I'll start again. So there was recent guidelines on uh, GP registration generally, which does include a section on overseas visitors, um, which encourages but doesn't require GPs to establish the country of origin. As Paul says, that is um, primarily to ensure that people can access primary health care if they require it. Um, so um, I'm afraid I don't have any more details on that, so that is something that um, we will need to write to you about. Um, the regulations that do make clear that people from out with the EEA are required to pay for health care um, and that um, those we expect GPs to be able to establish where people's um, country of origin is. I'm, 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 I'm interested in, in, in that reply and I wonder if you can tell us if Scotland in this respect differs from other parts of the United Kingdom in respect of... Uh, not requiring evidence of either residency or nationality for registration with a GP? I'm afraid I don't know that answer. I think given the nature yes. of the bill that's before us and the implications it may have for Scottish NHS finances, I think it would be very important to understand um, the implications of what you've described. It would seem to me, correct me if I'm wrong, it would seem to me if a person with no entitlement to free treatment is able to register with an NHS general practice without evidence of being entitled to free treatment, they could then very easily go through the entire health care system without being recognised as ineligible for uh, NHS treatment. So this, um, this particular legislation covers um, what well, could cover people, covers people from within the EEA who are entitled to free health care um, under the reciprocal health care arrangements. So non-EEA people are not required, are not um, eligible for free health care. So um, this wouldn't this bill would not impact on those um, individuals. There are separate arrangements set out in the regulations relating to the payment of health care for people from non EEA countries. Yes, I understand yes. That, that that point. I, I, I think the, the point though is that the bill will presumably apply mm -hmm. to citizens of EEA countries uh, the same rules that apply to uh, uh, non-EEA visitors uh, in the event of leaving the European Union without an agreed arrangement. Is that correct? Is that broadly the principle of the bill? So, if, um, no, if we were to introduce reciprocal health care, if we, the government's policy is that the reciprocal health care arrangements for EEA 
um, people should continue in force. Therefore, they would continue to um, in the event of um, in the event of an agreement. Um, a Brexit agreement that will continue under the existing arrangements until the end of the implementation period. In the event of no deal, there would be a need to put in additional um, provisions straight away to enable that to continue. So that would only apply if the um, if there was no agreement to continue reciprocal health care. Well, yes. I think uh, if I just so that I have correctly understood your question. The, the point is that because we do not oblige general practitioners absolutely to uh, determine the, or the country of origin of someone seeking treatment from them, that it is possible that someone who is not within the EEA could still get treatment from a general practitioner without so declaring. And this is the point which I think we should write to the committee about quickly, just to make that distinction that you have made and to be clear whether we are doing something about that distinction and furthermore to be clear about whether this is a different system from those elsewhere in the UK. So if, that, have I understood the question? That, that, that would indeed be helpful. The, the legislative consent memorandum appears to say that the bill is intended to go beyond EEA and to uh, allow for reciprocal health arrangements with other countries, third countries, we have already some with Australia and New Zealand, for example. So it is, I think, pertinent to, to know what the scope of the current arrangements may be, uh, and particularly uh, in addition to the point you've uh, come back to me there with the question of whether, if, if there is no check at the point of registration with primary care on origin and nationality, does that then mean that checks have to be made by hospitals when a GP refers a patient, or is it the case that there are essentially no checks throughout the system? Yeah, there are there are certainly checks performed in, in, uh, if acute services are required. But again, it would be good for us to just be completely clear about that stream with the committee so that we have um, put that on the record for you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I'm interested in any consultation that has occurred between the Scottish Government and uh, the UK Government as far as developing the scheme? Was the Scottish Government consulted as part of this introduction of the scheme? Do you mean the, the, this new, the, the bill or the or the EHIC? The EHIC in general. Liz, what's been discussed yeah. with the Government on EHIC? Um, so, um, the current arrangements have been in place for some time. Um, we had, um, in anticipation of, um, of, of Brexit, we had discussions with the UK government earlier in the summer at a very high level about what the future might look like. Um, but since then, um, there has been very little interaction, despite regular prompting from us to um, ask for further information from um, UK government. Um, we were informed at official level um, on um, the 22nd of October that there would be a bill, um, but um, that was not, it was not until Sorry, we were informed on Friday the 19th of October that there was going to be legislation and were given a copy of it, but it wasn't until Monday the 22nd of October that um, we were informed that the bill was imminent um, and the uh, Cabinet Secretary had a conversation with the Permanent Under Secretary of Health on Wednesday the 24th of October when he confirmed that, um, that the bill would be published and that there was a requirement to um, consult the Scottish Parliament. Um, and since then, we have had some limited conversations with um, ca officials um, in the Department for Health about strengthening the bill to recognise the um, devolved implications, particularly around um, consultation or um, ideally um, seeking the consent of the Scottish Parliament to amendments to the, any legislation passed by the Scottish Parliament. So there hasn't really been much connection with the health secretary in Scotland in order to develop this process, but now there is a commitment to engaging with the Scottish Government. Yes, so the, the, the current arrangements have been operating um, effectively for a number of years and there has been um, arrangement, um, has been a lot of consultation and engagement with colleagues around that. 
what we haven't been involved in to any great extent was the development of, the, of this piece of legislation. Um, we would expect to be very closely involved in any implementation around putting in place new reciprocal arrangements because that does impact on the NHS in Scotland. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Could you s briefly describe the reciprocal arrangements that currently exist with the UK government f um, for okay. uh, under the current arrangements? So the reciprocal arrangements are um, provided for at EU member state level, so the UK government administers the arrangements on behalf of the UK. There are three main schemes. S1, which is around the provision of um, health care for um, UK pensioners who have chosen to live in another EEA country or Switzerland and that covers the cost of their health care and a lump sum of €4,000 per year is paid by the UK government for that provision. Um, S2 is the provision of planned treatments where an individual can request um, through their health board to go overseas for um, to, elsewhere in the EEA, EEA to receive um, a, pr a procedure that is provided um, um, the same as they would get at home and that we understand from the EU returns, the returns that go to DWP, around 10 people from Scotland a year use that scheme. And then there is the EHIC, which is um, the obviously the part of the um, agreement that most people know about and that enables individuals to receive medical treatment um, if they become ill or have an accident in the EEA um, in, a, in the equivalent of the state healthcare system within that country. So some EEA countries do not have as comprehensive a healthcare system as within the UK. In those circumstances, uh, people may have to pay something towards the cost of their treatment, which they can claim back from the DWP um, when they come home. It isn't, EHIC shouldn't be seen as a, a substitute for healthcare insurance because it only covers the cost of the treatment. It doesn't co cover any additional costs such as the need to repatriate somebody home, additional costs for um, family and friend, family to be with the person or for rehabilitation periods. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Keith Brown. Thanks very much. Can I also just add to what the convener said and offer my uh, congratulations to Paul Gray on his imminent retirement. Uh, having worked with Paul for a number of years in the Scottish Government, it was clear to me that Paul contributed in all sorts of areas of government policy on a regular basis and was often the person that ministers went to, especially during SCORE and other crises, uh, to get something fixed. So I think you've got a great deal uh, to be proud of, uh, Mr Gray, and what you've done uh, for the public service in Scotland. Uh, and just to help you out in my last pre-retirement gift, my question will actually go to Mr Davidson, if it can. Um, a lot of people say that Brexit hasn't really impacted so far, and yet we look at the range of senior uh, highly paid officials here today and the work that you've had to do in terms of preparation for this. Um, and also the fact that, as I think as Emma Harper's highlighted, we're doing things at breakneck speed. We are not having the proper consultation carried out. We're having to agree things without having seen them, first of all. So obviously Brexit is having an impact, and it's mainly because of the possibility of a no-deal scenario. Can I ask whether <coughs> all that work going across, uh, on in this directorate would have changed had it been the case that the amendment that would have been discussed today at Westminster, which have ruled out no deal, would you, were you aware of, aware of that? Would it have been the case that that kind of parliamentary guarantee that no deal was not going to happen would have stopped this work or would you have to, had to continue doing it as a contingency in any event? <clears throat> I th to be honest, I think that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, um, my particular expertise in relation to these matters is about the relationships between the governments on legislative cooperation and, and obviously together with Shelley and many others across the Scottish Government uh, some involvement in the in the wider preparations. Uh, the government has at all stages taken the necessary steps that it's believed to be appropriate to prepare for all circumstances before us and I don't think anything actually in relation to that has changed, but as uncertainty grows and we get closer to the potential of uh, of closer to the 29th of March, obviously those preparations need 
to step up. So I don't think I'm precisely answering your question, but I'm not sure that it's really possible to do so with, other than to give that general indication that all the work that we need to do proportionately at different stages we are doing. I would hope that if there is a prospect by, and who knows what's happening in that uh, complete shambles, but if there was a prospect that something was going to rule out the need for this work, that the Scottish Government doing the horizon planning it should be doing would take that into account and desist from work that was going to be unnecessary. But a more specific question, and it may be for somebody else on the panel, is, and I could be getting this wrong, but if it's the case that the Secretary of State for Health um, will have the power to increase the fees, so say three years hence, we want to increase the charges which are made to other EU countries to keep these reciprocal arrangements. Um, and the limit on that just now, I assume, would be if you did it within the EU, that other countries would get quite annoyed about that and maybe take action against that, I don't know. But that limit would no longer apply in this circumstance. So my concern is that would it be possible for a future UK Secretary of State to increase the charges which are made um, and because of budget pressures or whatever else? And if that is the case, what possible detrimental impact might that have on the Scottish NHS, if you can follow? The, as uh, Mr Brown, and thank you for your kind remarks, as I said in, in my opening statement, the UK government officials have indicated that the bill will be amended to recognise the responsibility of the devolved administrations. And the particular point I would draw the committee's attention to is the requirement to consult devolved administrations and enter into a memorandum of understanding before regulations can be introduced that impact and devolve matters. So uh, the, the distance I can go based on what we have, and bearing in mind these are proposals, is to say that the current proposal is that there is a, re that there is a requirement to consult uh, the devolved administrations before regulations can be introduced. So to that extent, we would have influence over the decisions uh, that were made. Um, but, uh, of course, um, reciprocal arrangements work both ways, and that is to say that if we were to increase substantially charges levied on other administrations, whether within or beyond the EU, then, then clearly that, that would work in the opposite direction. And we do benefit quite substantially from the current arrangements in place. So under the S1 scheme that Liz Sadler mentioned, for example, um, around 15,000 state pensioners from Scotland benefit from this scheme uh, at the cost of 48 million. If, if something was to happen to increase these costs, then that, 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 would, that would not be a positive step. Just one last minor thing. I just noticed the, the list that we were given of non-EU countries which, with which the UK has a bilateral agreement. And it may just be a, an odd sample, but it seems quite idiosyncratic. So Australia, Falkland Islands and New Zealand, perhaps you can understand, but Kosovo and Serbia, are there particular reasons why we...? I, I couldn't comment on why the, the, the UK government had uh, okay. particular relations in particular places. Um, uh, no, I don't think I would go any further than that. Yeah. So, so in terms of the payment for treatment of Scots in those countries with which we do have reciprocal arrangements, who pays that and, and how is it paid? Yeah. So the UK, um, in terms of the, of, of the um, reciprocal arrangements, the UK government pays that. And doesn't recover it and from the NHS the cost in Scotland. the Scottish government, no. Okay. That's helpful to understand. Um, Alec Cole Hamilton. I mean, uh, can I just echo uh, colleagues' comments about uh, Paul Gray's service? Paul has always been very generous of his time and indeed his patience, particularly with uh, lowly backbench opposition MSPs like myself. So good luck, Paul, <laughs> whatever's next. Um, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions about recovery and the mechanisms for recovery of EHIC monies. Um, firstly, how was money recovered prior to 1415? So um, this is under the EHIC scheme. So prior to 2014, um, there was just a, an expectation by the Department for Work and Pensions that health boards and um, trusts in England would inform them of um, people who had received treatment under the EHIC scheme. Um, and there was actually, and then they 
the DWP then um, claim that money back from the person's country of origin. Um, there was very poor take up across the whole of the UK um, because it was seen as a bureaucratic um, process with no benefit to the healthcare provider because they were not getting any of the money back. Um, so the, the scheme was introduced in 2014 was an attempt to encourage people to report um, that they had treated people under EHIC and therefore 25% um, was seen by um, the UK government as a sufficiently um, large amount of money to encourage the people um, that but also um, not to um, and since then, the number of people reporting has increased significantly. But as Paul said, there are still five NHS boards who are not reporting activity. Um, so I, I think you've part, in part answered my next question, which was about the 25% from the DWP. So was that a, a sort of cash incentive then to, to encourage health boards to more readily record their EHIC activity? Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, and obviously, it's, it's still not perfect. Five territorial health boards yeah. not uh, reporting activity. Some who regularly do have delays and, and the rest of it. Mm -hmm. um, is there any way that in the future, um, particularly in respect of the new arrangements, that, that technology could make life easier in this regard? It just feels a bit clunky and uh, unnecessarily bureaucratic. Um, my understanding is that it's a relatively straightforward system to use. There's a, a, a secure portal that, pe that the boards input the information onto. Um, yes, in, in undoubtedly, um, in improving technology would help, but um, I, we, we don't know why people are not um, reporting. Some of the boards are smaller, so may not have very much um, business, so even at a 25% recovery, consider that it's um, bureaucrat too bureaucratic and to a cost more than they get back um, through the 25%, but as Paul said, he's meeting the chief executives this evening and um, is going to speak to the five um, relevant ones. Can you give us an idea of the f who those five are? Um, yes. You don't, I'm sorry to put you on the spot like that. No, no, I have... I, um, it's in the, it's in the, in the papers, it's sorry. It's in the letter. I think it's in yeah. the letter. Yeah. Um. Don't worry, listen, that, that's not hugely important. My final question, if I may, um, is how much of this do you think is about just culture on the ground, that people are, are not readily asking where the patients that present before them are from, or they're not thinking to make that connection to say, actually, we need to recoup monies here? Okay. So um, the five, just start, yeah. five boards are Dumfries and Galloway, Fife, Fourth Valley, Lanarkshire, and the Western right. Isles. Um, I, I think that um, within within acute care there is a requirement for people to um, establish where um, non-EU, non-UK residents are coming from. So I, I don't know why those five boards are not, whether it's a cultural matter or an administrative matter. I think, I think just to answer Mr Cole Hamilton's question um, in a slightly different way, the culture of the NHS in Scotland is to provide care to people who need it, uh, you know, and almost and ask questions later. Yeah. And I, 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 I'm not ashamed of that. No. Um, I think we should recover money where we legitimately can, and we should, uh, you know, observe the regulations and provisions that are in place. And uh, what I'm planning to do this evening is to make sure we're doing all that we can, because the NHS in Scotland should not do without money that it legitimately has access to. But as I say, I think our, our you know, our best foot forward would be we'll treat the person who presents with a need, and then we'll we'll, we'll seek the recovery afterwards. No, that, I, I fully endorse that, and I, I think it's something, a culture we should be proud of. I, I think my uh, desire to get those five <coughs> names on the record in terms of the boards that we we have who aren't collecting um, was really just to sort of bottom out whether there was a corollary between that and just the propensity for them to treat um, non-UK citizens, you know, if, it's, if they're particularly remote or not necessarily on the beaten path of the tourist trail. I don't really get that from that list, so it, it, it does strike me as odd. Anyway... No further questions, thanks. I wonder, Paul Gray, if you could tell us why the decision was taken, or when the de and why the decision was taken, that the, this would be our responsibility of boards 
dealing directly with DWP and not something provided for at the, in, in, by the Scottish NHS uh, in order to have a, a standard approach across Scotland? It, it is because it is a UK government scheme rather than a Scottish government scheme. But I think, nevertheless, the um, questions asked by this committee highlight an anomaly which I do intend to pursue. And, and in which direction do you intend to pursue it? I intend to pursue it in, term, in the direction of consistency. It is, it is clear that there is money to which health boards um, could be entitled, and therefore um, it, it would be sensible for them to have it. Um, if any of the health boards can advance a, a case that says, you know, they only treat two such patients a year and therefore the, the bureaucratic cost of doing it would be higher than the recovery, I'll, I'll listen to that. But I think I would want to be assured that, that that was actually the case rather than that a source of funds was being overlooked. So, so it's in terms of consistency of application by boards rather than a structural change yes. in the way that the matters are managed and in terms presumably of a consistent approach uh, to the registration or uh, treatment of patients from out with uh, the UK and out with the EEA. That's correct. Thank you very much. Sandra White. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and good morning, panel, and uh, good morning, Paul. I uh, wish you well in the future. Uh, I reciprocate what everyone else has said. You've always been open door to people wanting to ask any questions and basically diplomatic as ever. Uh, that's, that's what I'll say. Uh, just to go back to <clears throat> the situation with the health boards, obviously there were six at the beginning, uh, Dufresne and Galloway, Fourth Valley, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, which we've mentioned, have just joined. Uh, Fife, NHS Lanarkshire and the Western Isles, uh, basically. And as NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde is one of the biggest ones, it was a concern that they hadn't joined in particular. But you've said they've just joined and they've got money back of £120,000. Uh, and the papers of evidence that were given by health boards, they said the reason they didn't participate was because it was too too much bureaucracy. It cost them more money to get staff to, to look into it. So that was concerning as well. And it certainly outweighed the income. So I understand what you're saying, Paul, about various health boards in that respect. Now, you mentioned the scheme's been running for a number of years. I think it was the end of 2014 it, it came in, in that one. Has any analysis been done on the cost benefits of belonging to the scheme and not belonging to the scheme? Thank you, Mrs. White. I, I think that's one of the things I intend to pursue with the um, chief executives today. And, and actually, in a very simple way, just to ask those who are recovering money to say to their colleagues, well, this is this is why we do that and this is why it's worthwhile. Um, because I think the, the fact that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde have recovered £120,000 for one quarter, if you multiply that up, mm -hmm. that's nearly half a million pounds a year. You know, it's not a trivial sum of money. Mm -hmm. Um, now, the sums may be smaller for the other boards in question, but I think it's very important that we establish, as I say, a consistent baseline of activity. And I, my judgment is that the, the, the best way to do that will be to get the health boards who are recovering money to explain to their colleagues why that is um, mm -hmm. worth doing. And I'll certainly be looking by the end of this financial year to have a consistent pattern across all of the health boards. And if there are to be any exceptions to it, to understand it in a way that can be properly described. Yeah. So you would say basically of the five health boards that's just now, you actually mentioned the fact if it was too much money to put staff in, it's reasonable to expect they wouldn't join in this scheme, uh, basically. But can you tell me why Greater Glasgow and he Clyde Health Board decided that they would join the scheme all of a sudden? Is it because they see the benefits or...? Uh, yes, I mean it, it would be because they had seen the benefits mm -hmm. of it and recognised that there was a that you know there was an advantage to them in in doing so. Um, I, I, I think it's not so long as well since Greater Glasgow and Clyde got a new chair and a new chief executive, and I think they're probably well. I, in fact, I don't think I know that they have been looking at their governance arrangements and seeking to refresh these and, and strengthen them. So all of that will have contributed, I'm quite sure, to their decision. Uh, to take this offer up. And and if I'm being frank, being asked by the committee why you're not will have prompted some of them to think about it. OK. Could I follow up? Thank Sadly, you. Um, obviously, £120,000, it's not a drop in the ocean, but for the size of Greater Glasgow Health Board, as you say, it could be half half a million pounds or whatever it may be. Um, what, what I wanted to say was, 
the mentions in the papers about back money, uh, basically. So I don't know if the £120,000 is part of back money, but how far back can health boards claim? As far as I know, they have to claim, you know, as, as cases arise, but maybe Ms Sadler mm. could say a bit more about it. Um, um, this is, I mean, the scheme is administered by the, the UK government and um, we would need to investigate that further and write to you. Because it does say yeah. in, in evidence that you know, they can claim back money. I think I wrote it down here. Yeah, it appears that the claims can be backdated and the NHS Greater Glasgow have been collecting data on AH ick uh, since 2014-15. So would it just go as far back as when the scheme came in? Yes. So yes, it will only go back as far as the scheme, since the scheme started, because there was no mechanism before mm -hmm. that to reclaim any money. Yeah. Yeah. So we could expect to get some yes. information in regards yeah. to that. And just one last question in regard to uh, EEA, non-residents being treated. Do the boards still collect data on that? The health boards, do they, do they collect data on EEA? This is uh, non-EEA. Yeah, non-residents. Um, so non-EEA um, people... But EEA non-residents, oh, I think, was what Sandra It's all the actions. If they were resident here, would be entitled to yeah. treatment in the ordinary way, but is there data collected on the, those from those EEA countries who are not <laughs> residents? Yes, in the UK? my understanding is, is yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Could we deduce from the fact that Greater Glasgow have been collecting this data for several years but not making a claim uh, to the DWP to recover costs. Could we deduce that the other uh, health boards may well be doing the same? And, and, and do we have any idea uh, what that data has been, what has been done with that data since 2014-15 if it's not been used as a basis for recovering funds? That's what I want to find out from them, because they should be collecting it. We've all agreed that. Um, and uh, I want to know what they're doing with it. And... and Further to Sandra's question, is, is uh, can we be confident that boards know who it is that they are treating who is not either a UK citizen or an ordinarily resident in the United Kingdom, whether they're EEA citizens or otherwise? Well, we, we, uh, we touched on that, I think, in, in your initial questioning, convener, um, uh, and, uh, as the matter of general practitioners and primary care. Um, and I think I would like to write to the committee about that because um, giving any guarantee that I can be absolutely certain, you know, of the millions of people who are treated every year that we're 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 perfectly sure about each single one of them, I think would be well, it wouldn't be helpful to the committee, frankly. Um, I'd rather I'd rather get what we know and give it to you in short order than 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 try to speculate. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, uh, convener, and good morning to the panel. And um, just to add to your blushes, Paul, can I also put on uh, on the record my thanks, um, particularly I think um, as an opposition politician for the behind the scenes work which you've often helped assist uh, me with. And I think for uh, politicians across the parliament, that's um, really been valued, um, especially for individual constituents. We've been trying to get support on. Um, I wanted to pursue further um, issues around. British-born nationals being resident in different countries, but maybe coming back to the UK uh, for treatment. And I wondered if there was any collection of that sort of data um, when people are potentially returning home to the UK, but resident in different countries for, for treatment. We do. Now, I'm, I'm just scanning my paperwork here um, of people who uh, come under the S2 scheme, we know that fewer than 10 patients from Scotland choose to travel for treatment in the EEA. So in other words, fewer than 10 choose to go out of Scotland for their treatment. But those that come back, I'm not, we probably don't collect that because they, they, they you know, they'll be Scottish citizens and they'll, they'll come back from spending six months a year in another country and, and have, have treatment here. So, no, it's very unlikely that we would collect that. So we don't know a picture yeah. around that currently. Yeah. Um, in terms of, and that leads me on to my next question, in terms of um, numbers of Scottish uh, pensioners who are living in the EEA currently in other countries, um, do we have any data around that and how many uh, potential EU or EEA pensioners are living in Scotland currently? 
So I can tell you that there are 15,000 state pensioners from Scotland who are benefiting from the scheme. That, 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 that fact we do have. Now, in terms of pensioners from other European economic area countries, do we have these data? No. So um, the, the 15,000 Scottish pensioners is extrapolated from the UK figure um, in terms of how many UK pensioners live in the EEA um, for which the um, GWP, the Department for Health, pay €4,000 a year um, for their health care. Um, the amount that the UK, and that costs in total, um, sorry, I've not got that, I've got that, but um, there are significantly more UK pensioners who live in Spain, Ireland, France, and Cyprus than um, e EEA pensioners who come to live in the UK. So the UK pay out significantly more than they get back in payment from other countries for their pensioners who live in the UK. So further to sort of Cole Hamilton's line yeah. of question, is there any mechanism around that from people resident in other countries then? Or is it for the S1 scheme, S2 scheme, sorry, you mentioned? Or people, when they return to the UK, we're not necessarily sure where they're resident in the EU and the numbers receiving treatment? So we, so we can't tell if, if someone who would ordinarily be treated in Scotland comes back to Scotland, we, we, we simply right? can't tell. And it, it, Mr Briggs, I think you're asking, but if someone who would ordinarily be resident in Spain, let's say, a, a Spanish citizen, were to come to Scotland and have treatment, would we know? And I think that's the point I, I was going to write to the convener about, which is how, how do we know and on what basis and how many have we counted? Because I, I think we should assemble these data for the committee. Yeah. So, so we would know through the EHIC scheme how many people had accessed care using an EHIC card. Um, for some, for uh, an EEA resident who came to live in Scotland um, as a pensioner, um, they're entitled to free health care, but they would need, that would need to be, so they would be, it's in their interests to actually make sure that they are registered for that free health care so that they, um, and then the UK government claim the cost back from their country of origin. Um, there are very small numbers of people in that category. Okay. Um, and we would only have the number for at a UK level, I yeah. think. And finally, one, one issue which I wanted to pursue, which is kind of away from this, was around um, people when they die living abroad or die on holiday abroad and the repatriation um, around bodies. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's opportunities to improve that? Because I certainly know from my time as MSP, it's one of the areas where um, I've had a number of constituents who you've had to support in making that happen. Do you think there's an opportunity to improve that um, you know, internationally, not just necessarily um, EU-wide? It's not, as far as I know, covered in the proposed legislation that the committee is considering uh, today. Um, and that's why um, I think Ms Sadler made the point earlier about the importance of people also having appropriate levels of insurance, because that, that, that is not something that is covered by, by the EHIC scheme. Now, where, where governments, plural, um, you know, here and elsewhere, to agree to have some mutually a reciprocal repatriation scheme, then, then that, that, that is something that could be agreed, but it's not on the face of the legislation at this time. And, and essentially it would be primary, it would be a piece of primary legislation in, yeah. in, in a new area of law. Yeah. Effectively, I yeah. think that's right, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Thank well, you. Yep. Okay, thank you very much. Emma. Just a quick supplementary, convener, thank you. Anybody that presents for health care in Scotland without a community health index number, a CHI number, are traceable. Is that correct? So people coming from England without a CHI number, we'd be able to know where their you know, residence is or the, the fact that they're not resident in Scotland. That's so, but uh, again, this comes back to the point about the extent to which GPs would insist on such information before providing treatment. I'm using general practitioners as an example. The same would apply if someone was, you know, suffered an accident in the street and was collected by by, by ambulance and taken to to A and E. We wouldn't focus on finding out who they were and where they were from until we had 
you know, administer the definitive treatment they needed, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if it was very urgent. I mean, in my experience yeah. as an operating room nurse, yeah. it's handy to have a CHI number, yeah. especially if you're going to cross-match for blood Absolutely. and things, and just labelling and labs and just the whole system communicating. Yeah. So people are assigned a temporary CHI number yeah. if they pitch up in the emergency room. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, OK. It's just trying to get my head around the traceability aspects of Absolutely. people who you know, show up for emergency treatment? I mean, to be clear for the committee, uh, I, I do regard it as highly desirable that we know where people are from. And, you know, I, I mean, the more background you have on an individual, the better the treatment for them is likely to be. There'll be, you know, certain diseases prevalent in some countries that are not prevalent in others, for example. And again, just knowing all of that, um, and depending on the circumstances, will lead to both a better diagnosis and a better treatment and better care. Um, but as I think we've already established, that our principle is you know, provide mm -hmm. the treatment uh, that's needed. And I would support that as well. Mm. <laughs> Keith Brown. Two very quick things. Just the point before of 15,000 people from Scotland, I think, being an estimate of or an extrapolation of UK figures. I'd really quite be interested to know more about that, whatever information the government might have. And I'll also ask Spice for it as well. But I suppose my intuition would be that there'd be smaller numbers of people from Scotland, the north of England, Wales and Northern Ireland, living permanently overseas than there would be from the south of England. That's just my intuition. Uh, so it'd be interesting to know what that 15,000 uh, figure relates to. And I think it's probably also true, or my intuition would be there's less uh, people from overseas living in those parts of the UK, but it'd be interesting to know what that is. But my substantive point was on the point made by Paul Gray earlier about the culture of the NHS. Um, you know, 70 years of not having a vision of the NHS, which is a cash register by a bed, I think is probably quite an important thing. And it'd be useful in his pursuit of consistency if that the value of that was kept in mind at the same time as looking to properly see reimbursement for, uh, for services. We don't regard individuals as a source of income, I think is the way I would put that. But nevertheless, the NHS in Scotland and I, as the principal accountable officer, have a duty to recover such funds as may be available to us. I think yeah, that, my uh, point is that the idea, the culture behind the NHS of free at the point of use of treating people who need treatment has a value itself, and that should be borne in mind, in my view, when you're looking at the straightforward accounting of, of these things. Indeed. Further to Emma's question, my understanding is that UK citizens... Who are not, uh, who do not have a CHI number, who are not uh, registered with the NHS in Scotland, uh, may not be able to access if they're working abroad in other parts of Europe, in particular, may not be able to access care uh, in England uh, if they're returning to England, but may be able to access care free of charge in Scotland. Is that an issue that has come to the attention of of yourself or or, or any officer? It's it's not an issue that that uh, certainly is one that presses on us, convener. Um, we, we, in any case, uh, treat patients from England uh, on reciprocal arrangements, and um, particularly across the border between Scotland and England. Um, and, uh, I mean, I'm happy to follow up your question to see if there's any evidence of, 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 of that. Um, I can see in the abstract how it might happen, but, um, again, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't routinely be denying people treatment if we thought we need, they needed it. Absolutely. And again, that's not the suggestion, but merely to establish if there are any anomalies which may be impacted upon by this bill or may be carried forward into this bill sure. between the different levels of eligibility okay. in different parts of the UK. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, convener. And again, can I add my um, best wishes to you, uh, uh, Mr Gray, and all the work that you've done over many, many years. Uh, I think I would echo the positive comments from my colleagues. Um, can I touch on the final questions on contingency and planning? Uh, some of my colleagues at Miles Briggs have already mentioned the 15,000 Scots who live in the EEA out with uh, the UK. So we know that figure taken from the, the UK figures. If we had a scenario where uh, reciprocity of health ended, uh, and that would be the S1 route, um, have you done any uh, analysis of what the effect would be for the Scottish Health Services. I seem to remember the previous Cabinet Secretary talking about the number of extra beds that would be required if these 15,000 Scots came back. 
Obviously, you've mentioned earlier, you don't happen to know if individual Scots who are in Spain come back for a one-off treatment. But you will know, if you sipped across the DNs, and you will know these 15,000 need health care in Scotland. So has there been any detailed planning done on that specific aspect? So given that this, um, given, given that this uh, bill is, is, is before us, and given that um, the government has indicated that it re regards it as exceptional, this is actually a core part of our con contingency planning. But I don't know if Shirley Rogers wants to say a little more. Shirley has been leading for us on the, on the um, consequences of Brexit for, for health. Um, it might be helpful for the committee to hear some of the breadth of planning that is underway around anticipating the health care requirements. I suppose it, it links also to Mr Brown's question around what are we planning for and how does that work. So at the moment we are planning for um, a, a no-deal scenario on the basis that if that's as bad as it is, then anything that isn't that will allow us to, to recast those planning assumptions. We're planning on the basis of medicine supply, of medical devices and clinical consumable supply, reciprocal health care of which this is a, an element, workforce and all of the impacts around workforce potential supply and our existing EU27 workforce, mutual recognition of professional qualifications, and those are the arrangements under which um, we are able to use those medical and other professionals who have qualified in EU27 nations. Um, research and clinical trials, legislative deficiencies, contingency planning, readiness of NHS boards and social care bodies for operational impact, interdependencies with critical supplies, in particular food and fuel, and communications. So I, I, I use that to illustrate the breadth and depth of the planning that is currently underway for EU so, through. That, that's very useful, but just can you just press you on yep. the specific? Um, yep. Let's assume a scenario, and in the current climate, um, um, we, obviously it's very difficult to know what the next steps are, certainly after the fiasco we've had in the Commons yesterday. So let's assume that we don't have receptacle health care. 15,000 Scots need health care who are living abroad. Well, they are coming back to Scotland... How many more nurses, how many more beds, how much more spend are we going to require in Scotland? We don't have that information at the moment because we don't know the extent to which those 15,000 people are unwell. Right. So if those reciprocal arrangements are an issue whereby they've come back because they needed a particular um, sure. surgical operation from which they have recovered, <coughs> then the answer may be zero. If, on the other hand, those patients are people with long-term ongoing conditions then um, we obviously will need to factor those into account. And it depends on the nature and severity of the disorder from which those patients suffer. So we are working up a range of scenarios, but I don't have a percentage number for you at mm. this stage. But there is a potential scenario where there's no reciprocal health care that, that your department are planning this detail in case this happens. We are, we are doing some scenario work to plan for that, yes. Right. Okay. Could I just move on? And I think Mr. Gray has already mentioned this, but just so I've got this on the record, um, you'll be aware of the new EU directive on patient rights and cross-border healthcare, which is effectively an enhanced S2 route. So it means if uh, if I required a hip operation in Scotland, I could go to the EEA uh, either in the private sector or in an unplanned way or in the public sector get that done and charge it. So that's the new directive, uh, which has only recently been brought in, although it's 2011 stroke 24, just for the record. You may not have this information in your head, Mr Gray, but, um, but do you have any general information around this? Has this been used by Scots going abroad, or has this been used by other EEA uh, members coming to Scotland to get the treatment done here? Yeah. So um, we do receive an annual return on um, the use of this um, of the directive and um, on average around 30 Scottish residents use the directive each year to travel for treatment um, at a cost of around £50,000 per year across Scotland. Um, the directive allows people to get the cost of the treatment covered to the at the same level as it would have been mm -hmm. cost in Scotland. So if the cost is higher, they only get the cost of, it be, of, of Scottish care and it doesn't cover any additional cares such as travelling and um, any additional hotel accommodation, etc. Um, the directive is not part of this bill. 
um, and um, we understand that the Department for Health are considering the future of the directive and how it um, should um, should work, but we don't have any further details on that at the moment. Okay, so the, um, as it's not part of this bill, mm -hmm. if there's not any further legislation brought forward, effectively this right would cease for for UK. Yes, and it wasn't included in um, the terms of the withdrawal agreement, so yeah. um, it could potentially stop um, mm. at the end of March. It's not alone in that aspect, yeah. but yeah. certainly. Um, my, my take, and other members may have a different view, is I'm not surprised at the lower take-out, because I think, frankly, it's not very well known generally. And my final question is actually a UK government issue, but Mr Green may be familiar with it. I read in the press just the other day that the uh, for non-EU migrants coming to Scotland, particularly in health service, which we're all interested in, um, that the NHS levy has doubled to uh, 400 a month. So the scenario would be um, a nurse on over 30,000 a year coming from Ukraine to Scotland would have to pay this NHS levy to pay for the costs of accessing health service um, in, in Scotland. Um, is this something, again, that's been scenario planned in terms of workforce management? It's slightly beyond our legislation today, but since I've got Mr Gray captive probably for the last time, it might be useful either uh, today or perhaps in a written answer, because this does affect recruitment. And certainly the health service unions and professional associations have been very concerned uh, because there's also a big cost to the employer as well, but that's, that's another issue. No, we will write to the committee about that, because I think it's an important question and we should give you a proper answer to it. Okay, thank you. A brief supplementary, Sandra Hart. Thank you very much. It was a brief supplementary, and I want to thank Shirley Rogers for the list of the amount of work that's being done. We're coming to the, the nub of the frightening part of Brexit, if, if it is, a, is an ordeal. Uh, Dave Stewart mentioned about the 15,000 people in Scotland in the reciprocal health care, if they all came back from wherever they are. So if there's an ordeal, and it's the same, there's no reciprocal health care, you're talking maybe 10 times that amount coming back to England fr from abroad. How is that going to affect, if we've got Reciprocal Healthcare UK, and obviously DWP are working on this this uh, bill as well, and Reciprocal Healthcare there, how is that going to affect the healthcare in Scotland when it is reciprocal? If they couldn't get the healthcare in, in England and they happened to come up to Scotland? I know it's a scenario and I'm just, but you know, it's quite frightening when you think if there is no reciprocal health care, we could be looking at, yeah. you use the word tsunami, but you know, of people coming back. Yeah, well, we'd, we'd first of all have to assume that they all did come back. Um, and, and given that some may have made their lives elsewhere for many years, they may choose not to, mm -hmm. they may choose to take out insurance arrangements. So I think, um, as uh, Ms Rogers has said, you know, that there are, there are various detailed scenario plans um, that we are that we are doing, but <clears throat> I think the likelihood of um, fifteen thousand people all returning en masse to Scotland is 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 probably quite low. But it, what what I think may be more likely is that people would be less um, likely to choose to live abroad in future if they thought that the arrangements were. Um, less favourable, or they would have to take into account the insurance requirements that that could attract. However, I think I wouldn't want to miss the point that the, the bill that's before the committee today um, is is there, uh, you know, in preparation for whatever scenarios may emerge. And therefore, if the bill, and I'm not presuming on this parliament at all, but if the bill were to be adopted, given consent to, then it would resolve some of the issues that you describe, Ms White. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to uh, Paul Gray and officials for uh, your evidence this morning. Thank you also for the offer to come back to us with additional information. Can I say, uh, to put one further burden on you, that um, if we as a committee are uh, in a position to conclude our consideration of the LCM um, uh, at our next meeting, we would require that uh, relevant information to be with us by close of play tomorrow. However, I recognise that some of the things we have asked you to provide are not directly pertinent to consideration of the LCM. So if I may ask um, if there are matters that you're able to reply to us 
um, within uh, that uh, uh, time scale, that would clearly allow us to move ahead with the LCM and the other matters we have raised, which may require collection of data, um, data among other things, uh, in, in due course. We'll certainly give you everything we have by tomorrow night, convener. Excellent. That's much appreciated. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, now suspend for a couple of minutes, and when we resume, we will resume in private session. Thank you.